The Ashby Study's 12 Factors of Penetration place structural integrity as the number one most important factor when it comes to air penetration, especially if encountering heavy bone. Stay tuned and I'm going to show you how I build my broadhead and insert threaded adapters, how I glue these up to achieve the best structural integrity for my era setups, and you can do the same. So when we're talking about structural integrity of your arrows and building that structural integrity into your arrow, one of the most often overlooked aspects is the adhesive that you use to put those components together to build that arrow. And that's really what the focus of this video is going to be about today. Now before we get into that, if you're liking the videos we're bringing to you, please take a moment to like this video, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll be notified when we release new videos. Now a lot of people will use hot melt glue. A lot of people are going to continue using hot melt glue after this video. I did for many years myself, but I found that um, through some failures it's just not the best glue to use if you are like me and you just do not accept era failure as, as part of the equation. I tried CA glue for a while, specifically the, and when I say CA glue I'm talking about super glue. Uh, that included a, a rubber compound in the glue and that worked pretty good but I still had some some instances where uh, one of the components would separate from the arrow or in some cases where the uh, the pieces of steel would separate and my buddy Tom Jorgensen turned me on to the glue that or the adhesive that we're going to be talking about today and I'll share that with you in a minute but a few weeks ago I took a whitetail I actually hit a little high. It was a steep angle. I don't know if the animal dropped or my shot was just a little high. It doesn't really matter. But it did impact the spine. Uh, it didn't center the spine, but it, it hit the spine as it was as it entered. Uh, it immobilized the animal. It pretty much dropped in its tracks, but it did continue to try to move for about 12 to 15 seconds. Now after the arrow passed through and into the ground, it actually buried into a root deep enough that the arrow was lodged in this root while the animal was, was moving. And when I approached the animal after climbing down from my stand, I tried to re retrieve the arrow and realized it was actually something was broken. I could feel the tinge of metal rubbing against metal. So I finally wrenched it free and when I did, the arrow pulled free and left the, the bulk of the broadhead in that root. Now I was shooting a 165 grain uh, Simmons tree shark and what I actually retrieved with the arrow was the 100 grain insert that I use when I'm building my, my broadhead components. Now for those that don't know, the 165 grain tree shark is a glue on head. But I want that two and a quarter inch wide head and I want a removable head so I glue uh, the head to a steel adapter in the same manner that I glue the rest of my components. But in short, what happened, and I'll throw a close up up in the corner here, the ferrule from the broadhead was adhered to that steel adapter so well that it broke the tip of the broadhead or the tip of the ferrule off with the head and it actually ripped the blades away from the ferrule on both sides of the adapter and the, the epoxy that I use stuck. It, it held on to that. That's the kind of structural integrity I'm talking about. Now, the trade-off is this is a permanent combination once you glue these together. You're not going to get those apart, but I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. That's one reason I went to using the screw-in adapters. I do use steel adapters. I do not care for aluminum, um, and I know these steel adapters are at least available in 100 grain and 75 grain. I think you can get a steel adapter in as heavy as 125, but I'm not 100% sure about that. So let's talk about the glue for a minute. And the glue specifically that I'm talking about using was developed by 3M years ago for the purpose of gluing golf club heads to graphite shafts. Now the patent for that has since expired. I think they last seven years, but it, it doesn't really matter. But now there are numerous companies that are producing this same glue that, that was originally created by 3M. This, this particular bottle here, these are Dynacraft. Um, there's other ones available. I'm going to include a few links in the comments down below that you can use to get this glue. But it's not very, or this epoxy. Pardon me if I say glue instead of epoxy. It is epoxy. 
It's around $12 for eight ounces. It is a two-part epoxy, and it does take 24 hours to set. That's one of the biggest downsides, but the, the positive to that is, is an epoxy that takes that long to set is less likely to shrink much when it's curing, and therefore you don't end up with hairline cracks or, or places where the epoxy pulls away from the components as it dries. So this is the glue that I'm talking about using, and it is in part the reason why the structural integrity of my broadhead and adapters and the rest of my components as well are as good and as solid as they are. But it's only really one piece of the puzzle. Now in order to get those pieces to adhere well together, you have to prepare the surfaces, just like most any other thing that you're gluing, gluing together, you have to do that with your components as well. So the first thing you have to do, these are these adapters and the brawl heads both are machined and during the machining process they are covered in oil and no matter how long it's been since they were built, packaged and shipped, there's still going to be a film of oil on these and that's the first thing that we've got to get rid of. We've got to get rid of the oil that's on these components. Now to do that, you can use plain rubbing alcohol. If you've got it in your house and you have it handy, go ahead and use it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. I've seen some people say it can leave a minor film, and it may, but it's it's very minor. It's not going to leave uh, enough of a residue to cause a problem. An alternative to that is denatured alcohol. The benefit of the denatured alcohol primarily is it's cheaper, and I've always got this stuff around, so I tend to use denatured alcohol if I don't have my preferred method, and that is something that I'm currently out of, which is acetone. If you have access to or you already have acetone, I highly recommend it, but if you don't, either one of these alcohols work well. If you use the acetone, the one thing that you do have to consider is the, the receptacle that you use to, to soak your components in. With alcohol, you can use just a plain plastic cup, solo cup, like I've got here. If you're using acetone, you have to use a glass container. It will eat through plastic, so don't use plastic if you're using acetone. But you want to take all of your components, your, in this case we're just talking about the broadhead and the insert, but when I'm building my arrows, I'm talking about my inserts, my threaded adapters, and my broadhead. All of those get soaked uh, to remove all that oil. You want to put enough of your solvent, whether it's alcohol or acetone, to cover all the components. And I typically let them sit for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then I'll wipe them off with a... Um, with a clean cloth. What you'll notice in this cloth, this is just a plain white washcloth and you'll, you can probably see here there's some discoloration and this was from the oil that wiped off after, after soaking some components that I was working with in preparation for this video. So you want to soak them well, wipe them off well, and let them thoroughly dry before you move forward. Now once you have all of your components cleaned, dried, and ready to move forward, the next thing that I do is I keep two kinds of files handy. I've got a, just a small flat file and I've got a round file, like a chainsaw file. And what I use these for is to score the surfaces of any of my components that are going to be mated together because it does a couple of things. One, it, it gives the epoxy more surface area to bond to and it creates a rougher surface. So all I'm really doing, usually on these threaded adapters, I'm using the, the corner of the file and I'm just raking across. I'm not trying to take off a lot of metal. I'm just, I'm just scratching it up. And I will, the same as before with the broken broadhead, I will put this under a camera and put a little video up at the top to show you what this looks like when I'm done. Like I said, it's not a lot. I'm just, I'm just trying to scratch it up and give it a, some additional surface. Now these adapters are grooved, but it's just compounding the grooves by giving it another rough surface area for the epoxy to bond to. Now on the broad heads, believe it or not, I'm doing the same thing. Now this is an area where you have to be careful. These Simmons Tree Sharks here are new. They could probably cut me, but they're not overly sharp, but still you need to be very careful because you can easily cut yourself doing this. But on these, what I'm typically doing is I'm using the squared end of the file and I'm just going inside that ferrule and I'm scratching it up. And you'll see paint come out. 
Uh, that's another thing to keep in mind too is you're, you're removing uh, areas that have paint that could be ready to flake up uh, that won't necessarily bond well to that epoxy. So just spend a few minutes on each one. You want to make sure that you can hold it up to a bright light and see those scars and scratches on the inside. The, the file is harder than the ferrule on this broadhead, so you can, in most cases, you can feel it scratching and digging in. And it doesn't have to be a lot. You just want to make sure that it's enough inside that head that, again, you got those, actual, uh, those additional uh, scratches and surface areas for that epoxy to bond to, and you're removing a lot of that loose paint that could flake away and, and cause the, the, the bond of the epoxy to give way. So now once you've got those all prepped, you're just basically going to need something to mix up your epoxy on. Here I've just got a plain sheet of paper. Um, I've got a couple of toothpicks that I use to uh, stir those two parts together. The more of this you can do, the more likely that you're going to be uh, accurate in getting equal parts of uh, the two-part epoxy together. But it, from my experience, this stuff you don't have to be so exact. So as long as you're creating a spot to say the size of a nickel with each of the two components and then mixing those together really well, you should be fine. They should do well. Now, the other thing that I do is I keep broken arrows, old arrows, and I'll cut off little short pieces like this and I'll put a threaded adapter in one end and a knock in the other. And that allows me to do a couple of things. One, it will allow me to test, once I have everything glued up, it'll allow me to spin test these heads and make sure they're spinning true. The other thing it allows me to do is I can take some rubber bands once. You gotta keep in mind, this epoxy has to sit for 24 hours straight. So if you can, then the first five or six hours, you just wanna stop by every hour or so. Make sure that nothing has started separating because sometimes when you push these together, you can get an air pocket and it'll try to push them back apart. So you need to make sure everything's still seated well together, make sure it spins well, and then you can go on about your business. If it's not a situation where you can watch it, you can take some rubber bands, and on a vented head like this, you can push the rubber band through the vented head and then bring it down and hook it in your knock on each side. Do that on both sides of the broad head, and that's gonna keep equal pressure pulling down and keeping it seated while it cures, and it works pretty well. Then again, even if you're doing it that way, try at least maybe at the eight hour mark to come down, check it, spin test it, make sure everything still looks good. You wanna make sure it's true, because as I stated at the beginning, once this stuff fully sets, you're not getting it apart. So uh, you wanna be sure that you've got everything centered, aligned well, and that it stays in that, uh, in that manner, at least to the point where that epoxy is set enough that it can't separate any further. So that's pretty much it. That's how I build my components. Uh, I strongly advise using the 24 hour epoxy wherever you can, understanding that in some situations you may want to be able to remove components. Primarily for me, that's only when I'm tuning. Uh, in fact, I do the same thing whether I'm building a, a hunting arrow or if I'm building a target arrow. I've got target arrows that I built this same way using the same uh, 24 hour epoxy that I've been shooting for years uh, and unless unless I lose them uh, chances are they're not going to break the only time I've had an arrow break was during demonstration purposes where I was shooting into objects that I had no business shooting an arrow into just to prove how strong it was or sometimes if I hit hit my target at, a, at an angle or get a glancing blow sometimes that glancing blow can cause a carbon shaft to break a little bit further up uh, from the head but I, other than that, I haven't had any errors fail in years since I started using this stuff. So check it out, 24-hour epoxy. Strongly recommend it. Uh, I think you'll be happy that you went down this path once you see just how uh, tough and solid these things are. So until next time, take care all.